Across an entire civilization's worth of scientific discovery, there is no holier grail than the discovery of life beyond our own world. No matter how earth-shaking, no matter how incredible or terrifying, there is simply no terrestrial feat of science or technology that could ever rival what it would mean to forever answer that one most central of questions. Are we alone? Are you waiting? On a handshake with a sentient extraterrestrial, it's not likely that our own solar system would ever provide such a hello. But even in the neighborhood of planets and moons around Earth, we may be surrounded by forms of life that we've not yet discovered. If they exist at all, then as we write this in 2023, humanity is hot on their trail. And from vast dark oceans to high atmospheric clouds to worlds where life would have to look fundamentally unlike anything we've imagined, we've got some educated guesses on just where that life might be hiding. Mars was habitable. It's a claim that's not quite so irrefutable as to be presented as absolute fact, but at this point in human study of the Martian geological record, it's far more likely than not that once upon a time the planet Mars held all the requisite building blocks for life, with liquid water on its surface, a potentially thick atmosphere, and hypothesized tectonic activity in its past, Mars may well have been a prime candidate for life in ancient times. Today, the Martian surface is under intense scrutiny for any sign of fossils, biological signatures, or anything else that might indicate that life could have existed there once upon a time. But if life has ever existed on ancient Mars, then the existence of that past life brings up a fascinating question. Could any of it still survive today? Like a lot of what we'll discuss today, our understanding of the possibility for continued life on Mars comes largely from human study of extremophiles, organisms that can live or even thrive in environments with extreme conditions, temperature, for example, or salinity or exposure to radiation. In this case, though, the really interesting question is one of survival inside the planet's crust, underground and without things like light or a renewed supply of oxygen. On Earth, extremophiles have been documented at pretty extreme depths, so deep that that they've been discovered while people are digging out gold mines, and on Mars, it's entirely conceivable that microbial life could do the same. Deep in the Martian soil, insulated from the cold and radiation on the planet's surface, individual life forms could conceivably go dormant for up to millions of years without dying out completely. It's been observed on Earth, and it could conceivably happen elsewhere. But there's another even more fascinating potential habitat for surviving Martian life in underground reservoirs that are speculated to exist underneath the planet's south pole. First indicated by an Italian research team in 2018, these reservoirs are believed to be underground lakes of liquid water. So far, four have been identified as candidate reservoirs, sitting at least a kilometer and a half underground, and despite what would almost certainly be very low temperatures there, the high salinity of that underground water is likely to have kept it from freezing entirely. Add the potential of geothermal hotspots like the deep undersea vents that are believed to have given rise to life on Earth, and all of a sudden, present-day Mars starts to look very interesting. Although the combination of that salinity and the deep subterranean environment would be far too much for most earthly forms of life, even terrestrial extremophiles have proven capable of surviving in similar conditions, indicating that it's not outside the realm of possibility that Martian ones could have done the same. Of course, getting to those underground reservoirs would be a whole other endeavor, one that would likely be impossible without some sort of colony to sustain a mining operation. But if humanity were to crack open those caves in the coming several decades, then there's no telling what sort of next-door neighbors we might find. We'll grant that it might be a bit underwhelming for our first discovery of alien life not to be spacefarers or advanced life forms, but instead some puddle-dwelling algae. But, you know, we'll take what we can get. From Mars, oh, we fly out to Jupiter's moon of Europa, where an icy shell some 10 to 15 miles thick is believed to encase a vast subsurface ocean. In fact, that ocean is thought to be so incredibly big that it could contain over double the water volume that's found on Earth's surface, at a depth of up to 100 miles around the moon's actual rocky surface. That water, as best as humanity can tell, is probably salty, and at the moon's sea floor, there's a high likelihood that hydrothermal vents could be found because of how not only the water, but the moon's core itself is thought to be heated by tidal forces from Jupiter. These tidal forces churn the lunar innards around with enough sheer energy input that it's likely to kickstart many of the requisite processes that could eventually lead to life emerging within. Now, if the kilometer and a half of drilling needed to get to Mars's underground caverns would be difficult, then breaking through some 10 to 15 times that distance on Europa should rightly make the whole concept of identifying life there seem prohibitively difficult. But, difficult though it may be, it's certainly not inconceivable that we could find evidence of life with the right sorts of probes and exploration missions, and we might not even need to get to the moon's subsurface oceans in order to do it. 
The same tidal forces that churn up Europa's apparent subsurface ocean have a similar effect on the ice running across its surface. That ice is incredibly smooth. In fact, Europa is the smoothest thing in the solar system, but it's broken up by a series of ridges, often coinciding with long, rusty red streaks that paint ribbons across the lunar surface. Those ridges and streaks, plus a range of other geologic features, suggest that Europa's shell experiences tidal flexing, being squeezed in and out by Jupiter's gravity. And if that is happening, then it stands to reason that warmer ice or even liquid water might rise upward toward the surface. Hypothetically, that liquid water could contain life forms, which then would be frozen into the water as it turns to ice. Wait long enough for the moon to churn and pull against itself, and some of that ice and the life forms that it contains could eventually be churned right up to the lunar surface, just waiting to be discovered. From one icy moon, we move on to another, Enceladus, sixth largest of 146 known siblings in Saturn's orbital family. Like Europa, Enceladus is completely encased in clean, highly reflective ice, and it's believed to have a subsurface ocean of its own. Enceladus is a pretty small celestial body at just 4% the size of Earth, and with an ocean believed to be just 4 to 6 miles deep under some 20 miles of ice, it's believed to have a whole lot less liquid water in aggregate. But that might not actually be what matters here. Like Europa, Enceladus experiences tidal forces that warp both the interior and exterior of the moon, sufficient to keep things moving inside and keep salty water in a liquid state, and potentially even create the kind of hydrothermal activity that's believed to have directly led to the emergence of life on Earth. But unlike Europa, Enceladus has one more thing going for it. It's geysers. If you've heard of Enceladus at all, you almost certainly know about the many icy plumes of ejecta that spray outward from Enceladus on a regular basis. Those ejecta contain both water vapor in a gaseous form and ice. And if we reference back to what we just said about the potential for life on Europa to freeze into ice that eventually moves to the moon's surface, Enceladus could be doing one better. Quite literally spewing evidence of life out into the cosmos. Human-made spacecraft have already flown through the geysers of Enceladus, although the spacecraft that did that, Cassini, was not equipped with the requisite tools to confirm the presence of life outright or take a sample for return to Earth. What it did have was a sufficient suite of equipment to determine that Enceladus's insides did contain high saturations of organic materials, plus carbon dioxide, phosphorus, sulfur, nitrogen, and carbon monoxide, all things we'd expect to see if Earth-like life did exist there. That phosphorus is especially promising in the levels of saturation that it's expected to exist on Enceladus, potentially as much as a thousand times more than exists on Earth, it would be free for life forms to use in massive quantities. It's not a confirmation that life exists there by any means, but it's the sort of list that has rightly sent up a sort of bat signal for astronomers and astrophysicists, marking Enceladus as one of the most likely candidates in the entire solar system to perhaps already be incubating life forms as we speak. In the words of German planetary science professor Frank Postberg, it is habitable. It is clearly hard to argue against that, but we do not know if it is inhabited. Now, if all of this talk of subsurface lakes and icy moons seemed familiar enough to our human ears, then buckle up, because on Saturn's largest moon, Titan, we're going to go from the familiar into the downright weird. There is no liquid water on the surface of Titan. It's far too cold for that. But what does exist there, in abundance, are liquid seas, lakes, and rivers of methane, which on modern-day Earth is better known as natural gas. On Titan, it's not gas at all, and instead it flows freely across the lunar surface. Already, this would mean that Titan's building blocks of life would inherently look really, really different than the ones found on Earth. But the idea that Titan may play host to life isn't so simple as a series of abstract postulates by chemists who've got nothing else to do. It's backed up by the presence of an extremely high concentration of organic materials on Titan's surface, all things that would be really, really important if, say, Titan was to host some form of life that used methane or ethane, not liquid water, as its final building block. What that life might be like, we can't really say but it should be possible. The moon has a dense atmosphere, it's got liquid something flowing on its surface, and it's even got weather with rain and other climate features of its own. At present, a small contingent of global researchers is hard at work trying to figure out how life in that environment would function, including one team at Cornell University who postulate that life on Titan wouldn't use fatty lipid molecules like life on Earth, but would instead use a specific alternative molecule called acrylonitrile, something that Titan has in abundance. And if that wasn't already strange enough, data released in 2005 offered another compelling possibility that maybe Titan could host a subsurface ocean of its own where liquid water flows freely and is kept liquid by a mixture of 
high salinity and tidal forces inside the moon. In Titan's case, this ocean is thought to be at least 35 miles or 55 kilometers below its icy surface. In such a strange environment, the addition of subsurface liquid water could add an even stranger chemistry to the mechanisms that could underpin life on Titan, or hypothetically speaking, the moon could even have developed two completely unique forms of life, one based on the methane and ethane found on the moon's surface, and one based on liquid water, like the terrestrial life that we know here on Earth. And lastly, there's an outside possibility that Titan's inner ocean could be comprised of ammonia rather than liquid water, but it's in our attempts to imagine life made for some stage fusion of ammonia and methane that our creativity here at Astrographics just runs up against its limit. From Titan, we return to the moons of Jupiter, and this time to the volcanic moon of Io, where intense and often explosive geological activity has long been seen as prohibitive to the formation of life. Lashed by extreme cosmic radiation, covered in lava flows, and otherwise blanketed in ice in areas that are less volcanically active, Io presents the sort of conditions that would make survival impossible for just about all forms of life that we know. The moon's extremely thin atmosphere has no water vapor, and there have never been any traces of organic molecules on Io's surface. Historically, that combination of clear signs that life isn't present there has generally been taken as a pretty good indicator that life probably isn't present there. But for a while now, an astrobiologist named Dirk Shaw Machuch has offered an alternative take. Perhaps this fire and ice world, which in some parts very closely resembles human conceptions of hell, might actually host whole microbial ecosystems not on the moon's surface, but underground. In fact, once he laid it all out, the logic made a good bit of sense. The presence of icy crusts on some parts of Io would imply that water may still exist below the surface, heated up by volcanic activity and then trickling down to parts of the lunar subsurface that keep a steady temperature somewhere between that water's boiling point and its freezing point. Add the presence of that water to the heat and energy of the volcanic activity, and all you need is carbon, most likely currently trapped inside carbon dioxide compounds, in order to have the most basic building blocks for life. Except, well, you might not actually need water either. Io's volcanoes emit a lot of a compound called sulfur dioxide, which can then degrade into other sulfur-based compounds, most notably hydrogen sulfides that could theoretically be a substitute for water in this environment. Hydrogen sulfide plus carbon dioxide plus energy, given enough time, can theoretically be the basis for the evolution of a form of life unlike our own here on Earth. I will not belabor too much of the chemistry here, but suffice to say, Schulz Machuch and other subject matter experts seem to agree that in a theoretical sense, all this checks out. Bury those life forms under enough of Io's crust that they won't experience intense radiation, and in parts of the crust where temperatures are relatively high and constant, they might find themselves in a sort of incubator where they can thrive for thousands or even millions of years. Of course, we'll grant you the fact that scientists of Earth probably aren't about to start tripping over themselves to check for underground life when better candidates exist, but the moon's potential habitability simply cannot be ruled out. Now we've got to hang around Jupiter for one more entry, the planet's largest moon of all, Ganymede. Ganymede is somewhat like the other ice moons that we've discussed so far, Europa and Enceladus, in that its thick outer shell of ice most likely encases a global saltwater ocean with more water than can be found on all of planet Earth. Now that by itself is pretty cool, and it at least opens the possibility that Ganymede may host life of its own. But it's also got a couple of other positive markers that scientists have recently started picking up on that suggest that Ganymede might be one of the better candidates for extra terrestrial life in our celestial neighborhood. First, the moon's thin atmosphere does have water vapor in it, despite an apparent lack of the sorts of geysers that Enceladus has, suggesting that water's probably been up there for a while. That suggests that it's probably coming from regions of the moon that get warm enough, even on the icy surface, for water vapor not just to be produced, but to actually thermally escape into the moon's thin atmosphere. And second, the Hubble telescope has observed that Ganymede has auroras like the ones found on Earth, meaning that Ganymede has a magnetic field all to itself. This magnetic field interacting with nearby Jupiters will have caused the moon's atmosphere to be saturated with more oxygen than would otherwise be expected. And lastly, we've got to combine all of those essential elements for life, the oxygen, the protection from radiation, the water vapor, with the subsurface ocean that almost certainly exists under Ganymede's outer shell. Heated by the moon's rocky mantle, this ocean, made via liquid water, would interact with the nickel and iron in the core, creating a sort of chemical churning that's believed to have given rise to life on Earth. In fact, all the pieces are there on Ganymede for the creation of molecules like amino acids or sugars, and those molecules by themselves are probably present on Ganymede even as we speak. 
With the help of Jupiter's tidal forces to keep the ocean and the lunar core active, conditions are near perfect for some form of life, particularly one that relies on geothermal energy sources rather than external ones like sunlight here on Earth to be thriving in Ganymede's stable environments. In fact, some scientists now hypothesize that Ganymede, chronically overlooked in the last few decades, might be among the best potential hosts for life in the entire solar system. With any luck, somebody might even propose a probe to study the moon in the next decade or two. Finally, we soar above the clouds of Venus for one last stop on a visit that conventional planetary science wisdom would have you believe is a bit of a waste of time. But much like Ganymede and much like Io, there's a halfway decent chance that we humans might have written off Venus a little bit too soon. It's not for a lack of rationale. The temperature on the surface of Venus is hot enough to melt lead, and the pressure down there is enough that it would squash us fleshy hominids like a pancake. Not only that, but the whole planet is choked with sulfuric acid, a substance that would make even the hardiest extremophiles give the Venusian surface a one-star review. But high up in the planet's clouds, it's a different story. Devoid of the crazy intense pressures of the Venusian surface, and with a far lower saturation of sulfuric acid, conditions up there might almost be pleasant. It's got water vapor in the high atmosphere, it's gently baked by the heat of the sun, and there's enough wind to stir things around to keep the air from getting too stale. And not only that, but in 2020, scientists at Cardiff University and MIT announced that they'd discovered something even more important up there – phosphine. Now, of course, most folks watching this video are probably thinking some variation of, Simon, what is phosphine? And those of you who probably do know what it is are probably thinking, Simon, don't be daft. Phosphine is literally a poisonous gas. It's not a good thing. But, well, right as you may be, that also doesn't tell the full story. Phosphine is what's called a biosignature, a substance that, if it's detected on a rocky terrestrial planet, almost certainly would have been created by a living organism. It's the sort of compound that does not just happen by chance or without the complex chemical processes life forms use to go about their day-to-day -day business. And Venus's upper atmosphere didn't just have a little bit of phosphine either, it had a ton of the stuff, to the point where the research team that discovered it had announced that they'd ruled out every known process to generate phosphine except for the presence of life on our nearest planetary neighbor. Now, we've got to emphasize here that those phosphine claims on Venus were temporarily debunked while the scientific community did what it's supposed to do and attempt to disprove a promising theory. But shortly after the claims were debunked, they were supported again with some alternative hypotheses on where the phosphine might be coming from. Then they were debunked again, and then they were supported again. There's no telling how many times the scientific community might bounce around again on the phosphine issue in future years, but if it does exist on Venus, then the presence of some sort of life to produce it remains the most viable hypothesis that we currently know of. Hopefully, a series of upcoming missions to Venus, most promisingly NASA's Da Vinci probe, uh, will be able to settle the issue once and for all. If Da Vinci does manage to find evidence of life, it'll open a new realm of questions, most prominently how life could arise in a planetary atmosphere in some mechanism that's unlike anything we've conceived of on Earth. Nevertheless, there remains the possibility that Earth really is precisely what we currently understand it to be, a bustling, exceptionally well-populated, but ultimately lonely spheroid rock, a thing that is truly the only one of its kind. But we need only to glance over to some of Earth's closest neighbors to glean a bit of hope. For all we know, organisms that are like or unlike us might be thriving right now and hardly far away from our own doorstep. If that's the case, then absolutely, we're still hurtling through the void, but we very well could be doing it with a few friends beside us.